This is kind of a little bit off to the side, but how many 80-year-old men do I have here? Do I have any, any that are at least 80 years old? Stand up there, Rudy. You are standing up. Uh, no, I, I need, I, Mom gets to be the 94-year-old woman. Cause, could, are there any other 80-year-old? How old are you? Don, 78. Go ahead and stand up, Don and Rudy and Mom, if you would stand up. So I want the, all of you to look at them, and I want you to know that we have Moses at 80, and we have Aaron at 84, and Miriam at 94. And the three of, I know you're a year older than Miriam, we're, get, we're cutting you some slack, Mom. And, and we want the three of them to go to the city of Portland and say, we're going to lead you out to the promised land. Why are you all laughing? That's what God did. Go ahead and sit down. I, we get used to Hollywood and, you know, a 38-year-old Moses. <laughs> Maybe that puts... So, and the reason I did that was perspective. Sometimes we allow other people to give us biblical perspective. And maybe their perspective that they've given us isn't entirely correct. Right? And so we occasionally we need to have a, a reality check. And there's your reality check on the story of the Exodus. Now that puts Exodus in a little more perspective, I think. Um, we've been studying the law and how the New Testament writers used the law. Uh, now we're going to look at what most of us consider the law, and that's the Ten Commandments. That's when, anytime you say law, I think Ten Commandments, even though I know it's a lot bigger than that. And it should be no surprise that one of the most frequently quoted passages by New Testament writers and Jesus was the Ten Commandments. Because for the Jews, that was kind of the, uh, the heart of the law as well. Everything else revolved around the heart of the law, and the Ten Commandments would be the heart of the law. Okay? And we've already talked about you know, the Great Commandment, and the second is likened to it, but really those are found in the Ten Commandments also, right? So portion of the Ten Commandments quoted 12 times by New Testament authors, and half of those times it's Jesus doing the quoting. Now, that's direct quotes. There's a whole lot more inferences than that where they just kind of in passing talk about, well, and this is what this means and this is what that means without ever making a quote. And we'll look a little bit of, at that as well. Uh, Matthew 15, 4, and it's also found in Mark 7, 10. And this is kind of a, a conglomeration of the two of those passages. Uh, and Jesus is preaching. And he's meddling. And he says, God commanded, honor your father and your mother. That's, that's what God commanded. But you, you teachers of the law, say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you might have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God, uh, so with your tradition, you make void the word of God. So they had a tradition. You're supposed to honor your mother and father because that's the law. But God is more important than anyone. And so if... I have money or land or whatever, and I dedicate it to God, even if I don't give it to the church, then I can't really use that to help my mom and dad because, well, I've given it to God, and we know that God's more important than mother, and as important as they are, God's more important. And Jesus says, so you use your tradition, which, by the way, that wasn't in the law, that's something that they made up and added to 
really good idea, and their really good idea nullified the portion of the law that said, honor your father and mother. Ben. I was going to say there's a couple things wrong with that. First of all, they were given the land by God in the first place. It wasn't theirs to give back, as it were. It was theirs to be a steward of. But they're saying, even in this, God is saying, you need to take care of, you need to honor your parents, honor people in general, the, the law, the commandments in Deuteronomy include even sojourners in the land and visitors. They're saying, well, you're not important enough because I'm going to make God more important than you. And God is saying the importance is on who you serve. I, I have shown you how to do this. Now you show me that you can do it. So how important did God think family was? Pretty important. It, you know, it, it makes pretty much the top ten, as we call the Ten Commandments, right? It, it's interspersed in there. And God said family is extremely important. So much so that I'm going to make a specific point of it in the Ten Commandments? Yeah. Uh, we'll look a little later as should that be the end of it? Father and mother. How about sister and brother? How about children? How about... Uh, yeah, I think that's probably all in, in the spirit of the law included in there as well. Uh, Jesus and the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus gets criticized for uh, healing someone on the Sabbath. And they said, healing is work. And you worked on the Sabbath and it's, you're not, it's not lawful for you to work on the Sabbath. You're a sinner, you are working on the Sabbath. Do you remember the story? How did Jesus heal the man's hand? What did he say? Stretch it out. How much work did Jesus do when he had the man stretch out his hand? <laughs> didn't do anything. Well, didn't do anything physical. And their, their laws about the Sabbath were all about physical. How, much, how far can you walk on the Sabbath? Well, you can only walk so far from your home. Oh, well, if we, you can only walk so far from your home. What if you have two homes? Oh, well, you know. Now we can, we can, we can walk farther because we have two homes. Because we're staying within the, the distance of our home. Well, what defines your home? Oh, well, wherever you leave your cloak. Ah, so if I leave my cloak at Auntie Joe's, that's now my home too. And they made all of these sub-rules for the Sabbath. Andy Joe. But I think Israel back in the 80s, we were there over the Sabbath. And the hotel was <coughs> they had one elevator marked Shabbat. So you just had to get in. I, okay. I, you just had to get in, and it automatically went up one floor and stopped. You did not have to push the button because that was work. So that's how they were doing it then in Israel. So work was pushing a button to the elevator. In, in Israel, she says, when she went to visit there on the Sabbath, they had an elevator that you didn't have to push the buttons. It would go up a floor, and if you didn't get off, it would go up a floor, and it would, that way you didn't have to work by pushing any buttons on the Sabbath. How, how important was the Sabbath? Logan. Logan, yeah. Uh, you're, you're getting an idea of how important the Sabbath was supposed to be, right? The Sabbath was very important, but the rules they made were, we think, a little bit overdone. I worked with a guy in the military, actually, who was practicing or trying to be an Orthodox Jew person, and he couldn't turn on the light switch because 
turning on the light switch might cause a spark which was building a fire, which was gathering firewood, for which they stoned the guy in the time of Moses. So that's where it comes from that you can't push the button because it might cause an electrical spark. We, we have these, you know, I'm afraid that at times we're not much better. We've taken good scriptures and we've added our interpretation and we've made our interpretation as important or more important than the scripture. Jesus responds to them when they ask him about this. So, was the Sabbath made for man or was man made for the Sabbath? Why would he ask him this question? Well, first, what's the answer? Was Sabbath made for man or was man made for the Sabbath? The Sabbath was made for man because man came first, so it pretty much guarantees that man was made first, then the Sabbath had to be made for him. That, that's the logic that follows there. So why is that important? It makes the man more important than all their rules. Now, does that mean that the law about the Sabbath is not important? No. Again, what we had was people getting concerned about the letter rather than the spirit. What was, and Jesus goes into a, a lengthy explanation. Yeah, but you say it's okay if the ox falls in the ditch to go get him out because you don't want the animal to suffer on the Sabbath. That's okay. Uh, but it's not okay to release from bondage a son of Israel by stretching out his hand. Terry. Well, another aspect of it being made, man, a Sabbath made for man is that the Sabbath rules were for man's benefit to be good for him and with with all the extra rules that had been added over the centuries it got to where it was a burden to man not a benefit god meant them man needs to have a time of rest and no work you know god doesn't mean us to work seven days a week and so it was made not only for the reasons you that's been stated already, but it was literally for man, for his good, at least, at least a good part of it was. And, and Terry brings out a, an extremely important point that I want to expand on. The Sabbath was made for man for his benefit. Jesus doesn't say that, but that's the... That's the underlying current of his talk. It was made for his benefit, so why, if you can benefit animals, why can't you benefit a person, a son of Israel, on the Sabbath? Now, I'm going to start meddling and then I'm going to let Ben talk. What about the other laws? Were they made for men or were men made for those other laws? The rest of the law. Oh. Because what's applicable to the law about the Sabbath is probably applicable about honoring your father and mother and all the rest of them. Ben. I was going to say there's another thing, reason why that oxen meant money to them. And so their belief at that time when Jesus was talking to them is, well, the more wealthy you are, the more blessed you've got to be by God, which is actually not the truth. God blesses us in a lot of different ways, and money is such a minor thing, and it also takes away from us seeing God as the benefactor of the good things he's given to us, the law being part of that as a teacher to instruct us 
the reason behind the law, that spirit of the law that says people are important and how we relate to them is very important. So how we relate to people is important. Uh, the, ben says that they were viewing that as a financial thing and finance was important because it showed God's favor upon you. Uh, and, and there is some of that. Uh, wasn't that what the Puritans believed also? You show that you're blessed by God by how much money you have. Uh, Paul quotes this same passage in Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Uh, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land that God has given you. <clears throat> so Paul quotes this in when he's giving instructions to uh, churches that this, Paul seems to indicate that this is still a pretty valid thing. That honoring your father and mother is probably still important. How about the promise? Is the promise still applicable? Now, the promise was so that it'll go well with you in the land that God has given you, but uh, in a generic sense, is that promise still Auntie Joe thinks that it is. I tend to believe that, yes, that that promise is still meant for us too. Honor your father and mother. And that that's what God wants. Uh, and that that's going to be a good thing. Logan. How important honoring your father and mother is may be seen in the part of the law that says if you have a child and that child is uncontrollable and disobedient, that child is to be stoned to death. So the parents are to be honored or else. And if you're stoned to death, it's not going to go well with you and you're not going to live long in the land that God has given you, right? It, Obviously, the Ten Commandments were pretty serious. Breaking it is take the child out and stone him. How serious is honoring your father and mother? It sounds like it's at least as serious as the Sabbath, doesn't it? Now, there's a whole long passage, and we're not going to read it all. We're going to just touch on it briefly. Uh, we call it the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount, or any of a number of things. And really, it starts off with, you have heard that it was said. And where did they hear that it was said? In Scripture, specifically the law. But I tell you, or I say to you. Now, Jesus will then talk about anger. He'll talk about lust. He'll talk about divorce. He'll talk about the truth. And he'll talk about love. And what he does is he takes the letter of the law. You've heard that the letter of the law says this. And what I'm telling you is that the spirit of the law means this. And he takes and refines that down pretty tightly. He makes those passages much more difficult. Uh, it's no longer just an, a simple, easy to do uh, checkbox. And is it supposed to end with that, that one refinement that Jesus has made, or is it this is the spirit, and you need to apply it in multiple ways. Well, I think it's the spirit, and you need to apply it in multiple ways. And I have to give a little deference to the Pharisees here. We criticize them for doing exactly what Jesus did here. And 
took the law and they said, well, this is what the law means. Uh, now, we're not going to criticize Jesus for doing that because this is Jesus. And unfortunately, much of what the Pharisees did may not have been uh, as good as what Jesus did. And so we criticize them, but what they were doing in some respects, they were trying to do what Jesus did. They just failed miserably at it in some cases. And we highlight all the places where they failed at it, but they got it right a lot of times too. And so the problem for the people was, how do we know when the Pharisees have it right and how do we know when they failed miserably? Uh, one of the areas where they got it wrong was they decided that their teaching about the law was as important as the law. That my law addendum, paragraph A, is as important because they made it more letter of the law rather than spirit of the law. I think that's one of the areas where they, they failed. <clears throat> so in the three gospels, the letter is just the start. It's not the end. It's just the start. It's the starting point from which you can then determine the spirit. Uh, Matthew 19, 21. Rich, uh, young ruler comes to Jesus and says, well, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what's the law say? And he quotes the Ten Commandments. And, Jesus, and he says, and I've done all of that. I, I've done those things. I am doing those things now. What else can I, what, what else do I like? I, I've done the Ten Commandments. And Jesus, we, we read in one passage, and Jesus loved him because he was honest and he was sincere. And apparently, Jesus looking into his heart says, he really is doing those things to the best of his ability. And he says, if you would be perfect, and this doesn't mean without fault. It means complete. If you want to be complete, you want to really fulfill everything, then go, sell everything you possess, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. And what happened? He went and sold everything and followed Jesus and became one of the 12 apostles. No, 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 that's not how it reads. He went away sorrowfully because he loved his possessions more than he loved God. See, as Ben pointed earlier, God's showing how blessed I am and how good I am by my possessions. And if I give them up, how are people going to know how good I am? I mean, that's how people know how good I am. Because look at how much God has blessed me. This passage also kind of intimates, isn't that what those brothers Zebedee and Peter and Andrew did? They didn't sell everything. They just left everything and went and followed Jesus. He's just telling him to do what the others have already done. Ben. I was going to say what we imagine treasure to be and what God says treasure will be are two different things. We, yeah, I think he had the problem of thinking what he has is what he's going to have in heaven. And the treasure that we have in heaven is being in the presence of God, knowing that we have done what God has asked of us and we've done our best to try and achieve that not in the fact that in achieving it we get the reward, but because he has given us that promise of being with him. And that's the treasure. It's not something we can go and take or earn. It's something he's given, and we have to realize that. 
You know, I, I think our, our problem with treasure in America is that we forget we're living in the most prosperous country in the most prosperous time of history. And I don't have what Bill Gates has, so I'm not rich. Yet if I went anywhere else in the world, I would be rich. But we don't compare ourselves to the rest of the world. Uh, we compare ourselves to a uh, pampered athlete or uh, Bill Gates or uh, you know, my boss. Or we don't take into account the blessings that we have. And so we are poor. And the poorest among us are richer than most people in the world today or ever. And we don't count those blessings. If you're faithful in a little, you could be faithful in a lot. We've been given a lot. James, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. If you don't commit adultery but do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. Um, I think it's important to note that both of those are um, in the Ten Commandments. That James, we sometimes apply this to the law. And I think James is very specific in, he's framing this in terms of the Ten Commandments and the intent of the Ten Commandments. If you do one of the Ten Commandments and fail in the other nine, you haven't done anything. If you do nine of the Ten Commandments and fail in one of them, you're still guilty of the Ten Commandments. Now, that's the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. I think sometimes we make this bigger than James made it. But contextually, those are both the Ten Commandments. So, if that's the case, James says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged under the law of liberty. Now, Paul makes a big deal about the law of sin and death, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, versus the law of liberty. <coughs> liberty to do the right thing. Military had a saying that what we want is people to do the right thing when no one's watching. That's how you know you're doing the right thing. Nobody's watching you and you're still doing the right thing. That's what we wanted people to do. That's character. And what's the right thing? It, we, didn't, we, we never defined that. We didn't say, and this is the right thing for you to do and here's your checklist. Just do the right thing. That's the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. Do we want, uh, I, I love Bill uh, Bismeyer. I don't want what's coming to me. I want mercy. That's, that's a Bill quote. I love it. I think Bill has the right of it. We don't want judgment. We want mercy. Well, if you're merciful, then you can have mercy. And if you're judgmental, you will get judgment. Which do you want? Which one do you think you're going to get based upon how you are? Oh, that's a harder question. How we look at Philippians 4, 11 through 13 
sheds light on not on judgment and mercy. It's kind of back another another slide where you're talking about how about the rich young ruler who was had a hard time letting go of his stuff and, and the, about us being as blessed as we are. This Philippians four eleven through thirteen talks Paul's talking about being content in whatever situation he's in. I'm able, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And that, that's something that instead of compa- instead of comparing ourselves to, to whoever has more than we do, we just need to focus on our relationship with God and with Jesus and how we are how we're measuring up to the example that Jesus showed us. And if we if that's our focus, then we can be content no matter what. Paul was we see examples of Paul being content when he was in prison with his hands and feet locked up and he was singing praises to God in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. That's, that's our, where we should be looking for our example of how, how to live and what kind of attitude to have about people, whether they have more than us or less than us. It, it does, that doesn't matter. It's the mercy and, and not, not judging people by the way they look or what they have or don't have. I think it's just as bad for us to judge a rich man and condemn him because he has more than we do as it is to look at somebody that's homeless and sleeping on the street and and having to use the bathroom on the street because they don't have any place else to go. I, it's it's either way is wrong. Yeah. And judging we're going to receive judging judgment. the rich is still judging. Yeah. Uh, Paul would say, Oh, no man, anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law for the commandments and any other commandments are summed. You should love your neighbors yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. Ben. I was going to say an interesting way to look at this was something I watched in a movie. This one happens to be Iron Man and he's captured and Basically, he's dying, and the guy that he's with says, well, do you, ha- you have everything, and yet you have nothing. And that is a point that we have to take into consideration in ourselves. Do we seem to have everything, and yet nothing? I look at these rich people, and a lot of them are all alone, because in order to get there, they have to trample people. I'm not sure I want to be rich. I have family around me. I have people who care about me. They help me in so many ways. So you kind of have to put it in perspective. What is riches? Riches to me is having family and friends. I can't control them. But at least I know they have my back, as it were. They are there for me, even in the worst of times. To carry your analogy even further, the man who helped save his life had family killed by his devices and still help save his life. Ah. Love does no wrong. Leviticus 19.18 says, love your neighbor. And it's quoted eight times in the New Testament and five of them by Jesus. How important do you think it is if Jesus quotes it that many times? It gets recorded that Jesus said this five times. Okay, we'll grant that there are three gospels and it might get the same quote, might get quoted more than once, but that's probably a pretty good authority that loving your neighbor is an important thing. And I won't go into the who is my neighbor and the Good Samaritan because you know that. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 16 is about loving God, fearing God, and don't put God to the test. There's a whole bunch of different passages in there and they get quoted 
And seven times it's quoted, and they're all quoted by Jesus. Test or not to test? God. God says to test him to see if he keeps his blessings. He says don't test him to see if he keeps his curses. God is faithful in both. See, part of the thing that we're to get out of all of this is that God is faithful. Don't test God if he will do all of the bad things he said he will do if you don't do what you're supposed to, because he will. But do test him to see if he'll do all of the good things he said he would do. So when it says don't test God, you can bet it's saying don't test to see if he's going to do the bad things he said would come upon you if you didn't do what you were supposed to. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That's from Deuteronomy 32, quoted by Paul in Romans 12. Uh, this says that if somebody wrongs you, you shouldn't take care of it yourself. That's how Paul uses it. The Hebrew writer uses the same passage and comes up with a whole different idea. Hebrews 10, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge. Same person said both of those. The Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For those who are doing right or those who aren't doing right? Vengeance is mine. He will repay includes God dealing out what he said he's going to deal out. Ben. Ben. I was going to say, in all of that, it is a, whether we're doing what's right and being God's people or whether we're not, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Whether his wrath is terrible towards you or whether his mercy is for you, he is still someone to be respected in all aspects. There's another place in the Bible that says, Fear not man who can kill the body. Fear God who can kill both the body and the soul. Yeah. Yeah. We we sometimes take things out of context, but I want you to notice that Paul and the Hebrew writer both make a good application of that passage, even though they're wildly different. Why? Because they're looking at the spirit of the law rather than just the letter of the law. And the spirit of the law usually is much broader than the letter of the law. Uh, We haven't talked about it, but they talk about moral laws that are in the Bible and they transfer over old and new. There's a lot of that that goes on. Uh, Passover was the 14th day of the first month. There was an alibi Passover on the 14th day of the second month. Alibi Passover is my term. Uh, If you were traveling or you had touched something unclean and could not and were ceremoniously unable to partake of the Passover, you were allowed to take it a month later and do everything on the Passover that would be done on the Passover a month later. Because the spirit of the Passover was so important, they didn't want anybody to miss it because uh, they were having to travel or that they were certain. My relative died and I had to bury them. I'm now unclean. I touched the body. Right? That's important too. And so they had a a method for that. Uh, Also, if a stranger sojourns among you and would keep the Passover with you, uh, according to the statutes of the Passover, everything that's in, written about the Passover, so shall he do. You shall have one statute, both for the sojourner and for the native. So if there's a non-Jew who says, wow, this thing sounds like a really great thing, I would like to participate in that with you, let him. Let him. Just tell him what he needs to do and let him do it. Uh, 
but he's not one of us. That's okay. He doesn't have to be one of us. Because there's going to come a time when the Passover is for him too. There will be a Passover lamb. And it'll cover him too. John 19, 36. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Uh, that's referring to the Passover lamb. When you fix the Passover lamb, don't break any of the bones. And John applies that to Jesus' death on the cross. Why they, they broke everybody else's legs, but they didn't break Jesus because he's the Passover lamb. And you don't break any bones of the Passover lamb. That's the reason that this passage gets quoted there. To explain why his legs weren't broken when everybody else's was. Because he is the Passover lamb. And if his legs had been broken, then it would have violated what you did with the Passover lamb. That's the context of that passage. We'll, talk, we'll be thinking about that when we do this a little later. Discord in the church. Timothy compares those who cause strife in the church like Korah's rebellion. Anybody remember Korah's rebellion? Annie Joe, you remember? Korah and some of his followers said, who made you to boss of me? Nah, that's, the, that's the seven-year-old version of it, and it's pretty accurate. And what happens? And the ground opened up and swallowed them and all of their followers. Okay, anybody have any questions about whether you should follow Moses or Korah? By the way, you can pick right now while the ground is still open. Choose you this day who you will serve. Now, that's, somebody else said that, but pretty much God made it pretty clear on, on who had made Moses the boss of them. And this is also quoted from Korah's rebellion. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Uh, the people were told to depart and don't be too close to Korah and his tents. The phrase was depart from iniquity, depart from those workers of iniquity. Don't get too close to those guys who are causing discord because it's not going to go well with them. And Timothy uses that to talk about people who cause strife in the church. That's a pretty harsh reference. Terry. It's very appropriate that Timothy uses this to uh, talk about causing, causing problems in the church because basically the children of Israel were, were God's church at that time. And these were people who were members of that church who were causing strife and fomenting uh, rebellion against the leadership of that church, which God had designated to be Moses and Aaron. Who we had and, stand up earlier. Yes. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a stretch at all. It's a, it's a okay, here's the, here was God's church in the time of Moses, and now since Jesus has come and established his kingdom, his church, it's just as serious for you to be causing rebellion or, or uh, causing people to stumble by causing dissension in the church as it was for Korah to rebel against Moses because it was, they were rebelling against God just like Peter said, you're not lying to me, you're lying to God when, he, when uh, Priscilla, not Priscilla and Aquila, but Ananias and Sapphira sold yeah. the land and said they gave them yeah. all the money and they really didn't. 
we've come full circle now to why we had Moses and Aaron and Miriam stand up. They weren't chosen because they were the physical specimens that would inspire uh, confidence. They were chosen because God chose them, and that's all they needed. Well, I see we're out of time. I thought we would finish this. I will look and see if there's, for next week, whether we finish this or move on to prophets. But uh, thank you for your attention. And we will continue to look at how the Old Testament is used in the New Testament next week.